Welcome to the Thundercast, your martial athletics podcast produced by the fans, for the fans, with your hosts, Russ Livingood and KD Hudnall. We're bringing you the thundering word on the thundering herd each and every week. So keep it right here. The Thundercast is on the loose. Thanks for downloading another episode of the Thundercast. You can find us on Twitter at Thundercast underscore pod. Russ, we had, uh, again, a very up and down weekend in herd athletics. And it's for a kind of different reasons. It's almost the polar opposite of why it was up and down from a week ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we've got a lot to talk about. Of course, this is going to be a very, very football heavy episode because of all the news that has come out and the results of the game. So uh, we've got a, a very intriguing five things. We've got a very, I mean, it's just some things that are going to take a lot of conversation and we won't know a lot of some of these things for weeks and weeks and, and weeks uh, to come. So, uh, but first, you know, let's, let's go ahead and do this, but let's get us a word from our car, our um, sponsors at 304 car If you've been hurt in a wreck, visit 304 car on the web or on Facebook. Our roads are full of uninsured drivers. When they hurt you, your insurance company can become their insurance company. Insurance companies take your money every month, but they fight you when it's their turn to pay. Don't be a victim twice. Jason and Matt can't protect you from uninsured drivers, but they can protect you from the insurance companies. Find them at 304carwreck.com. All right, well, let's get this bad boy rolling. We've got a lot to discuss and some things that are kind of um, not really, I wouldn't call them earth shattering. I think some people saw some of these things coming. I mean, not all of them, I wouldn't think. So let's get it rolling. Give me five things every herd fan needs to know this week. Five things every herd fan needs to know this week. As always, brought to you by Nightlink, the Tri State's premier IT management team. Number one, Madeline Hart named Sunbelt Swimmer of the Week. Uh, for last week's, I believe it was the Purdue Invitational that mm-hmm. they were at. And um, she is now three out of six uh, that we've had for uh, Sunbelt Swimmer of the Week. She uh, Esther LeBond did it twice, and now Madeline Hart has it for the third time. So three out of the first six goes to Marshall. Program's rolling, man. Program is rolling. I told you, Ian Walsh and, and what he talked about, to us at, the, at just one time at, at the tailgate there a couple of months ago was that they had some real positive energy going around this thing. And there was some uh, real excitement. You know, he thought mm-hmm. this might be a nice leap in the program, you know, taking a step forward type thing. And <laughs> three out of six uh, SBC swimmer slash divers of the week. I think that lends to it. Yeah. It's looking up and uh, look to get uh couple of divers on there as well because they separate those swimmers Mm -hmm. and divers uh number two we are bowl eligible with that victory that we're going to talk about uh for our featured story and when we had to win two of the last three games a lot of people had written that off but we're not we're bowl eligible yeah you know what and i did a little soul searching uh and i thought to myself it's easy to go back and go why was i worried right? Because the, the game in between the two victories caused concern. <laughs> you get shut out in a, in a, you know, all that was lined up there to have a winning regular season potentially and all that stuff. But then I started thinking, dude, 75 week is his own animal. And Marshall just, no matter what's going on, if it's a great season, a good season, an average season, a bad season, or a piss poor season, Marshall always seems to play one of their finest games and sometimes their finest game of the season on 75 week. And then you're thinking, you know what? There's always senior day left to go. And for the most part, throughout my herd fandom, the herd plays kind of on a different level there, too, because they just want to send their seniors out the right way. The seniors are playing their last game at the Joan. So they've got, you know, something extra pushing them. They want to do it, you know, just they want to they want it to be the result that they want. So 
while I was questioning some things, I still felt we would find a way in this game. I, I, I didn't really feel like we were going to go in and, and you know, kind of get boat raced in this game or lose this game. I thought it might be a little more hard fought than it was, but taking into account senior day and 75 week always come at the last part of the season. And when you need some wins, that's really two things that really do play in the favor of the herd. You know, you're going to have two late season games at home. You're, you, I don't think Marshall, unless they just totally, you know, go away from giving the herd a home game close to 75 week, you're pretty much going to have two of your final three, if not three of your final four, maybe at home. So when once I took a little stock, it didn't seem as daunting uh, from a holistic standpoint as maybe it did week to week. Yeah. And um, I think that it was, uh, you know, after you lose five in a row and yeah. you can only lose six in a season. So five in a row, I mean, it got everyone on, on edge, uh, but we did it. We did it for the seniors. We did it for the entire team and we are going bowling. And here's what I have seen so far. <laughs> Let me uh, guess every bowl <laughs> that could possibly be Marshall's in it. <laughs> well, I, I've seen uh, this is just from uh, three of the more likely uh, predictors that do it all season long. So this is 24 seven ESPN and uh, uh, Brett McMurphy from uh, action. Uh, so we've got four out of those uh, three. They had us uh, for four different ones. Saturday, 12, 16 Myrtle Beach, 11 a.m. Saturday, 12, 16, Orlando, that's the Cure Bowl, mm -hmm. uh, 3.30 p.m. Uh, Monday, 12, 18, Charlotte, that's the Bahamas Bowl, 2, 3 mm -hmm. p.m. And then Thursday, 12, 21, uh, Boca Raton at 8 p.m. I can't remember the name of the Boca Raton Bowl. It might just be the Boca Raton Bowl. Changes but it's something. all the time. It, it's like some advertiser Boca Raton Bowl, yeah. I think. Oh, it's, um, it's the roofclaim.com Boca Raton Bowl now. Now. Yeah, and and that that I think that actually might be the name of their stadium down there. Oh, now really? Roof claim. Yeah. Um, but something to keep in mind, we have 12 from the Sun Belt that are eligible. Yeah. And we only had officially, I think, six bowl tie-ins or something for the Sun Belt. So someone is going to get moved around. Uh and you just don't know where. So we don't have to necessarily go and be restricted to a Sun Bowl, Sun Belt Bowl tie in as it was coming into the season. Uh, but so far that we've been predicted for those. Yeah. So a couple things, right? Yeah. I, I know there's a big draw for folks that you think, oh, yeah, man, let's go back to Myrtle Beach because folks like to go to Myrtle Beach from West Virginia. Okay. You know, but I'm not, I'm never really a fan of playing in the same bowl destination two years in a row. You know, I understand you can't be choosers. It's not like you get a say. Yeah. Now they, they might come down and say, Hey, we've, we've got a couple options for you. Where would you like to go? But we've kind of learned here that ESPN controls all the dice. It is not so much about tie in specifically when you're talking about there weren't enough teams to fill certain slots or whatever. And that's why James Madison and Jacksonville State both got bids to begin with. So a lot of these bids are just going to get tossed up in the air, specifically those lower tier bowls, you know, that are going to see a lot of six and six matchups, a lot of those early season bowl games. And we've learned that ESPN is just going to match teams up to where they think they're going to get the best TV ratings. They don't mm -hmm. really care if it's easy for you to travel to. They don't really care if it's Christmas day. They don't really care. It's all about TV ratings for them. Whereas when we were in Conference USA, it was a little bit different. You know, there was a there was kind of a pecking order, and you know, you had more of a say. And I, I'm not confident that we're going to have that much of a say, unless, like I said, they they come down and go. You know what? These two these two three four ta uh, game matchups are going to be roughly the same. Where would you like to go? You know, and I don't know that they'll do that. But we know a lot of Sun Belt teams are going to be shuffled around. If you got, you know, the only ones that are really going to have any good idea are probably going to be Troy and App State because they're going to the SBC title game, one and two. You know, they're going to try to get some good matchups in there. James Madison's going to be a good draw because they're, you know, 11-win team. 
but I don't know how that's going to play out. You know, are they going to say, you know what, enough of this crap. Let's give them a marquee bowl matchup because they're an 11 win team. Or are they going to go, we're going to take care of everybody else. And James Madison, since they were a final team to get a bid is going to go kind of where everybody else is. I don't really have a opinion on that. I personally would kind of like to see him have to get matched up against Liberty. I think that would be a great bowl matchup. And if, and if, uh, ESPN's after TV ratings, that'd be a good one. You know, two Virginia teams, one undefeated, one one loss team, put them against one another. And uh, I don't know. I, I think if it comes down to it, obviously I would love to see a Florida Bowl because that means I get to go. You know, so I'm a big fan of Orlando and the Cure Bowl, big fan of Boca, big fan of the Gasparilla Bowl on uh, uh, December 22nd. If you've got your druthers and you're going and checking all these little boxes, December 16th, for a couple of reasons, is not ideal in my opinion. One, you went to the Myrtle Beach Bowl last year. The New Orleans Bowl is on there, too, and there's a couple other. But that's the first day of bowl games, which means the smallest amount of prep time for a bowl game. And we have some big news that rolled through the program that kind of needs to be taken care of before we get to a bowl game, hopefully anyway. Uh, the other thing you want to take into account is December 21st, the bowl game in Boca Raton, that's the only bowl game that day. So that's going to put you on a lot of eyeballs on you because mm -hmm. you're the only game. Same for the Gasparilla Bowl the very next day, December 22nd, Raymond James Stadium in Tampa. Only bowl game of the day. So that's premier slots. And if you can somehow land in one of those two, as far as early season bowls go, that's that's two thumbs up for those two slots. Uh, the Also, the um, – what is the one that's uh, – the uh, would you call it the uh, Bahamas Bowl? Yeah, is is that is that the one that's going to be? In... It's in Charlotte now. Yeah, but but um, it's not. I'm on the bowl. Uh, it's Monday the, the 18th. Okay, Monday so the they're 18th they're 18th the still future. labeling it as Nassau. That's why I was like, yeah. what? So yeah, that's the only bowl game there as well. But it's a Monday, you know. Uh, Thursday and Friday of that same week are the Boca Raton Bowl and Gasparilla Bowl, respectively. So. Working backwards, I would hope that we'd landed in Tampa, then Boca, then Charlotte, and then one of those first day full of games, right? Uh, but but there's a lot that the herd's got to take care of. It doesn't really matter at this point. We're bowl eligible, and when you stare down the barrel of a five-game losing streak, I'm not settling for a six-win season, right? I'm not happy with that. I don't think anybody's ultimately happy with that, but it sure as hell beats the hell out of watching bowl season from home. So. Yeah. Take it for what it's worth. We're not in a position to be choosers. The only thing really we'll know in short order is the bowl destination, specifically if it's one of those December 16th games. You got to get practices in, you got to get preparations going, you got to do all that kind of stuff. You get 15 practices, you want to start taking control of all those, and you got to take into account travel and all the other stuff they make you do for bowl games or bowl week. Mm -hmm. um, let's hope we hear something soon. What's the most important thing though? Buy your bowl tickets through herdzone.com. Don't go to StubHub, some third party, nothing. Go to herdzone.com, buy and support Herd Athletics with your bowl ticket purchases through our ticket office. The bowls will be announced uh, for everyone on Sunday. There's a selection show that'll be there uh, the third this Sunday. Uh, and I think that's it. Uh, they start at noon, maybe, and it's going to be like noon to two thirty. And I think somewhere around there is when the bowl selection show is. So we'll we'll know here in a few days. But yes, get your tickets through Herd Zone. So I think that we will know. <laughs> let's the teams at least, the schools will know at least before that, because if it's what is Sunday, what is the date? The third. Um, so, okay, so 13 days later, you're playing the first bowl games, and you're supposed to have 15 practices. The math ain't mathing, right? Plus, you got to travel I think and you all can, that stuff. I think you can go ahead and practice this week, though. I don't think there's a restriction well, that's, against that's that. that's what I'm saying. So you know you're in. I think our schools will know, and they may not announce it, but um, I'm not saying you can't practice. I'm just saying if you're playing one of those first day of bowl games, you know you're in. It's not like you're waiting. They had too many bowl eligible teams, and now you just got to wait and see if you get a bid. We know we're getting one. So even though they're not announcing it, I think they'll know the school and the administration will know beforehand. All right. Number three, Rasheen Ali in that game went over a thousand yards for the second time, and that makes him one of five to do that here at Marshall. 
one of five. I, n- I know it's a short list. I can probably mm-hmm. rip off a couple of them off the top of my head. Let's see if you that, can do it. I remember that Steve Cotton put some out there, put them out mm-hmm. there, but I don't remember the list. Uh, I'm guessing, I'm going to say uh, Chris Parker. I'm going to say he's number one. I'm going to say Doug Chapman. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say Brendan Knox. I'm going to say, I, re- I do remember seeing Ron Darby. I, that would have been the one that I did. I wouldn't have gotten, but I don't know the third or the, 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 how many have I said? Three, four. I said four, but I don't remember the fifth. Let me think. Well, you uh, missed Franklin with, Wallace. You no, know, you missed it with Knox. Uh, <sighs> Parker and Doug Chapman both had three different right. 1,000 yards. So they're number one and number two. Uh, I would just, in ranking those, Parker had more yards. So he would be number one. Chapman would be number two. Ron Darby and Darius Marshall both each had. Oh. Yeah. Darius they had Marshall. two. And I remember Darius Marshall, his uh, freshman year, I think it was his mm-hmm. true freshman year, had about 730, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. And then he came back and had back-to-back 1,000 yards, and then he left early for the draft. Mm-hmm. Um, Ron Darby, I don't have his years in front of me. But uh, also, too, I guess we can go ahead and talk about this. This was from Steve. Uh, it says, Ali also moved up a notch into number eight on the Herd's career rushing yardage list. He now has 2,739 yards, surpassing Glenn Pedro, 2,724 yards from 90 to 93. With 119 more rushing yards, Ali would pass Brendan Knox, Darius Marshall, and Butchie Wallace into number five on the all-time chart for Marshall. uh, So speculation. Let's let the speculation begin, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, we we did not see Rasheen Ali in the second half of the game against Arkansas State. And I'm just going to be frank. I don't know that we see him in a bowl game. I really don't. Because um, he could have played even the first drive of the second half and just been like, all right, I'm, that, I'm out. Because that's usually what you see. You know, you come out, you get, you play the first drive or two in the second half, and then they take the guys out, right? Um, it, it feels like he... We got him over that thousand yard mark. He stayed healthy, like we were talking about the other day, and then they just kind of shut it down. I would be interested. I would be very interested to see if he participates in a bowl game. I'm not trying to cause a ruckus here, but it just feels like you. We may have seen Rasheen Ali take his last carry for the herd. What do you think? Well, I'm going to do the opposite. We'll play like uh, that. Uh... Uh, counterpoint, point and counterpoint. <laughs> point, thing, counterpoint. You know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to take the opposite way okay. uh, and say that by what we saw in that game, it was not indicative of him playing in the bowl game. Now, that being said, he still might not play in the bowl game. Right. But I don't think that it was because he came out because he was over a thousand, because he got that early on his third carry. Uh, he had a, 27 yard run four yard rush four yard loss as soon as he got handed Mm -hmm. off the next was 27 yard rush and that put him over a thousand he had 11 more carries after that throughout the Mm -hmm. first half uh i think it was around 315 left in the first half he had a carry and took a hit and uh he got up and he kind of looked over to the sideline and i think maybe even motioned and then they brought someone else in he never came back in the game Mm -hmm. So that was during a drive that he came out. He didn't finish that drive. Um, I'm thinking a little bit banged up. We're up 28 to seven. Why risk it? Uh, 35 to seven, kind of handling them in the uh, second half. No reason to put him back in. Um, So I don't necessarily think it was, well, he's over a thousand. Let's take him out because he played so long after that and took what would have been, if you're only trying to get him to a thousand, unnecessary carries yeah no I, i'm i'm with you right i, I agree mm-hmm. with all that uh i was just kind of thinking like well you know if it works and, and it's and it's and it's grooving then maybe you play another drive or two just to see how right. high you can get that total so what i mean is we get him over a thousand not like you right. immediately pull him he just sure, sure, sure. The, the thousand yard mark yeah. and then doesn't come back 
So I don't know, man. It just it just feels like, you know, he went through senior day ceremonies, and I know a lot of guys do that if they're unsure about their future, which Huff is a big mm -hmm. proponent of. And personally, mm -hmm. I am too, because we've seen guys over the last couple of years since Huff's been here do that and return. Stephen Gilmore did it, right? Mm -hmm. Porter did it. They returned. Right. So the door is wide open for him to say, I'm coming back. Mm -hmm. But he's – taken some injury, been dinged up a little bit, and he's got a bright future ahead. He has yeah. real ability to play at the next level. So there's a real balancing that you're going to have to, you know, ask yourself. You're going to have to make these decisions he and his family are. And it just would not surprise me if we saw Rasheen Ali carry the ball for the last time for the herd during senior day. That's all. I, I would expect that, that he has, because he has a full year after graduating. He graduated last year mm -hmm. and, and walked last year. Um, he participated in senior day. He has eligibility to come back, but it's almost to the point, why risk it at this point? Yeah. Just for me, that's, that's nothing more than a fan's view of me saying that is why risk it, because he proved that he came back after the injury. I mm -hmm. think he kind of had to do that. You know that he still has that burst. He's still one of the baddest man uh, men to to carry a football, and uh, I think that uh, he needed to do that before he went into the draft. He did it. He came back, reestablished himself. Uh, he got nicked up again this year. I wouldn't risk it for another year because of what lays ahead. He's already got his degree. He has yeah. put his service to Marshall. Uh, so. I think that is our final game that we saw him. I just don't know if he's going to play in the bowl or not, like you, you're you speculating. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he goes. Maybe he dresses. Maybe, you know, he plays a little bit and sees if it's a go. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe he wants to be in the top five all time, and 120 yards puts him there. You know, maybe he comes in early and breaks a 75-yarder, and he's like, I got 50 more yards in me. Let's do this. Who knows, right? Selfishly, as a herd fan, fan, I want him back. I want him back next year because we're a better team with him, right? He gives right. us a great chance to win football games. From a business standpoint, I understand that he's got uh, potential options in front of him that I will never have, right? And while I selfishly want to see him come back in Kelly Green, absolutely I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it will not hurt my feelings if he's like, I'm taking – a run at the next part of my life. I am going Absolutely. to try right now as a 20, however old he is, 22, I don't know, to set myself up for the remainder of my life. We would do the same. Yeah, sports is the only thing where we kind of have fans judging uh, athletes and student athletes, uh, I mean, that uh, for going into a professional career early. If you're if you're in a business uh class and you get your degree and then you come back and in the middle of grad school or taking additional classes, somebody comes in and says, Hey, here's $500,000 a year to come start at my company. <laughs> you know, you don't see people out there going, I can't believe he left early. You know, yeah. he had another year that he could have taken more classes and, <laughs> and things like that. We just do not do that. Um, and it is out of selfishness that we, uh, as fans want to see these uh, great performers come back and play for our team. Sure. Um, but I, I don't know if he plays in the bowl or not. Uh, I don't know that we're going to get any kind of a statement on that. I think it's one of those that we'll just know kind of the day of the game. Yeah. Well, if you get a statement, then it's going to, that that's it. If it's like, I'm going to the NFL, well, then you know, all right, he's not returning. He's not going to probably play in a bowl game. You know, he has the invite to the East-West Shrine Bowl still on the table. I still haven't mm -hmm. seen if that's been accepted or not. So, we'll see. You know, maybe you sit the bowl, you play the East-West Shrine game for a little showcase game. I don't know. Man, we don't know, right? Hope he plays. Hope he plays for the Herd in a bowl game because that will fuel the Herd to uh, have an easier path to victory. Yeah. Number four on our list, uh, Christian Spears put out a uh, statement on social media and on the official website for Herd Zone that Coach Huff will return for another year. He mentioned some changes that were made and that he supported Coach Huff, but he also said that, you know, our expectations are X and we need to fulfill that for next year. So yeah. kind of setting that uh, 
that up to say, hey, here's, you know, we're none of us were okay, including the coaches, with the results we had this year. We we expect more, but our coach will be back. Yep. And I like that. I like the announcement. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I had some conversations through via text message um, that people hit me up as soon as that uh, statement came out. And it was kind of like, wow, that was kind of odd, really. And I thought, I don't think that's odd at all because you put to bed immediately. Is Huff the guy for Mm -hmm. 2024 or not? And you Mm -hmm. alluded to we're uh, confident or something in the changes already made. Right. And he's mm-hmm. thinking, OK, so what happened? And then shortly thereafter, well, I'm sure we'll talk about what what came out of that. But I like that uh, that Huff is back because it puts all that discussion to bed. Right. And uh, it's it's a final <clears throat> year of his contract. There's another th- there's some other points that we have to talk about. Some fans, you know, um, will ask the questions like, you know, will you lose more money by not, you know, um, bringing in somebody else right now you didn't give him an extension and how are you supposed to recruit and all that and they're all valid questions right they are all valid questions doesn't mean they're worthwhile to ask Uh, all of them some of them are but here's the Mm -hmm. thing in the statement christian spears said at marshall we honor our commitments right Mm -hmm. and that means charles huff is under contract through next season so they're honoring that commitment to him means one of two things or a couple of things He does well, turns it around, staring down the barrel of an extension, right? Um, The the downside of that is there's no, there shouldn't be much of a buyout, if any, because there's no extension on the table. You know what I mean? So uh, if if he does really well and and doesn't sign an extension and gets offered another job, well, Marshall's just kind of got to hire the next guy. I'm willing to take that. I'm willing to take that, right? Because I think we're, we're moving, you know, building blocks, right? And uh, some of the things we saw in this game against Arkansas State, offense looked notably different, Mm -hmm. which fueled speculation. Uh, Was there a change in play caller? And I don't know. I mean, this offense looked notably different, though. And that's a valid question, too. I don't know that we'll ever get a true answer for that, because why would you, you know? But uh, I am okay for sure with Huff remaining as the coach for 2024. The the focus now shifts on those changes that were alluded to and how they ultimately play out. So let me say one more thing about uh, this statement or the repercussions or the results of this statement. So many people thought you need to just buy out the coach and go get another coach. Do you know how much money that takes? And that Marshall's not in a position to just do those things. This isn't Texas A&M where you pay a guy $76 million to not coach your team and then go hire another coach. Okay. So you have this character thing of honoring your commitment, which I respect. We should all kind of do that just generally in life, but B we don't have these unlimited funds to buy out a coach and then go hire a coach. And then, you know, all new, uh, coaching staff and you know you still got bowl game prep i mean what do you what do you want to do here it, it's just not the right move to try to do that and if if you think it is then i would implore you to step up with your checkbook because you got to create that money it's got to come from somewhere right and i don't know that there are too many people willing to do that they're willing to say we need to do this we need to do that but when the rubber meets the road you got to write a check to come up with the money for that buyout uh, that notwithstanding, that's not an opinion of mine one way or the other. I'm just saying that is a situation that exists for Marshall. We don't really have the funds available to continue doing that or to do that. But I'm okay with Huff returning. I like it, right? I like him as a dude. I like him as a coach. I like him as a uh, leader of the program. Mm-hmm. I think now he knows and we all know that the onus is going to fall on who you bring in to make this offense in 2024 look more like it did against Arkansas State. Right. And and to look that make this defense uh, look more like it did in 2022. So that's where the that's where the the questions lie. And we won't know that until probably the end of next season. Really? I like the uh, I like the statement. 
I like the timing of the statement. Yeah. I like that Coach Huff is coming back. Uh, I like uh, everything about it. You got to remember that we have uh, early National Signing Days, December the 20th. Yep. All right. What would it look like if we're waiting until after the bowl, December the 16th, 18th, 21st, 22nd? We just talked about these. Right in the middle of that is signing day, mm -hmm. early signing day. And if you have speculation that we don't know if this coach is coming back, what would that look like to your signing class? Um, I know a lot of people still sign early. The regular signing class is February the 1st signing day. But on that early, uh, we're still going to get some people signing. And I, I just think that this statement and this decision needed to be made when it did. And I think it was 100% the correct decision. Yeah, You know, you, you bring Coach Huff back. I've been a fan of his since the hiring was announced. Uh, I have uh, said uh, many times that I like the character of the players that he's brought in. I like the uh, direction of the program. Um, people say, really? We lost five games in a row. Every now and then you're going to have things that don't work out the way that you think they're going to. OK, I still don't think that that means, well, we shouldn't have hired him back two and a half, three years ago or whatever. I think that's silly. Um, we could have hired uh, Saban could have come here himself and said, you know what? I want to take over someone uh, from my home state of West Virginia for my final five years. He could have lost five in a row. That doesn't mean that it was a bad decision to hire Coach Saban. Right. Um, but. I like that he came in and he said, well, we need to upgrade the size of the players at these positions. We need to do this. We need to do that. He brought in a lot of portal depth that we did not have uh, before he got here. And due to injuries this year, we had to get into that depth and play some younger people. And there was a noticeable different kind of play, I think, when we had to do that. That doesn't mean he was the wrong coach to hire. I think he was 100% the right coach to hire, and I look forward to next year because I fully expect us to like take a huge step forward. I don't see another six and six year. If you rebuild, you bring in another coach because Coach Huff only has one year left, and you buy him out and say, hey, we're going to start all over because six and six was not what we expected this year. You're going to bring somebody in. You're going to have a – hell of a roster turnover and you're going to say, well, I'm not sticking around because I don't know who the next coach is. Don't know what the scheme's going to be. I don't know. You know, it's just things that happen. Mm -hmm. And with the transfer portal, the way it is, you're going to lose a lot of your roster. Then you're looking at a, a total rebuild, implementing a new system. What if you go three and nine? Yeah. Are you going to be happy to bring somebody in three and nine? They say, absolutely, people absolutely would not be. Yeah, and then you say, well, year two, you know, we're getting back and we're going for a bowl. It's building. Well, hell, we already got we're that here. right now. Why don't we just keep <laughs> trying to move forward? You know, it, to yeah. me, I just don't I don't get it. Um, I think uh, there's been unfair criticism because of five losses in a row. Uh, I do think head coaches get that criticism. I don't think it's unique to Coach Huff. You know, I mean, that's just the nature of the business. But um I, I think that uh, we're going to see a big step forward, and I'm 100% for this. Yeah, a lot of folks are going to sit there and go, listen to these guys. They're apologists. No, we're not, right? Because I wasn't happy with losing five straight games. But no, I'll, tell you, I, I'll tell you what I did notice, a marked difference in a really healthy Cam Fancher versus a limited mobility dinged yeah. up play and hurt Cam Fancher. And you can't yeah. say otherwise. He was yeah. a totally different quarterback against uh, Arkansas State than he was at pick whichever game you want to pick in the middle of that five-game stretch. So That's there's right. a lot of promise there. And I bet you a lot of fans, and I know for sure a lot of fans that have been dragging him for two-thirds of the season, if not more, came around a little bit because they said things to me and to us, you know, like, wow, I, I was judging him wrongly a little, maybe uh, it wasn't a lot on him. Maybe it was a lot on the, you know, the, what was being called and again, fueling speculation for who was calling plays in this game, but whatever. I, I just think it's the right move because people also will sit here and say that they will take, they will just assume that your current players will stay. 
Mm-hmm. They don't have to stay. You get rid of mm-hmm. your head coach. Now all of a sudden they're like, well, I wanted to play for him. And all this promise that you had, you thought you had coming back now is compounded with what's whose eligibility is exhausted. Guys like Porter, and Burton, you know, and Neil, Abraham, all those guys can't come back because they're done with eligibility. Now look at these young guys that we spent all season building. Dude, they can hit the portal too, right? Now what are you going to do? How, you got to bring in 80 guys to build a roster from scratch? How many players uh, have said that Coach Huff was the decision or a major decision that they came here? You right. know, right. Uh, they, they bought into his program and not just – the results of the wins on the, the uh, scoreboard, it's about, you know, how you do it and, you know, the values. And I, I, I'm a big fan and I don't care who disagrees with me. You know, I, I don't have this show to try to come up with the most popular opinion. So I'll have a, a high success rate of, you know, people agreeing with me. That's not why I have this. I have it because I'm giving my view and I'm not going to change my view for anybody. I mean, this is my view. Yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you like it or don't like it really me either. It doesn't matter if I like the decision or not. It's the right decision. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. You reevaluate based off of next year, right? You fulfill your commitment, reevaluate, see if the changes that are made to the staff take hold. We look a little bit different. We're pushing that eight, nine win total vying for a Sunbelt East division championship. That's what you got to, you know, they might say the message that they preach is one and zero every week. And that's fine for a football team, but for a fan, you don't, you want to go one and one and zero every week because ultimately that means you're going to be 12 and zero. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you want to know that you can weather the storms, the ups and the downs, and the 10 straight games because you had an early bye week and compete for a Sun Belt championship. That's what it's all about as a fan. Mm-hmm. You're playing for a title. That's it. You know, they'll show up, they'll cheer, they'll, they'll, they'll jeer, they'll do all the things in between, but they want to win a championship. So give them an opportunity to compete for that. Number five, we have alluded to it in what we were talking about, but we have four assistant coaches have been let go from the program before the bowl game. It was immediate uh, the night of this game after the conclusion. They uh, they let go offensive coordinator uh, Clint Trickett, offensive line coach Bill Legg, wide receivers coach Jovan Bonight, and uh, linebackers coach Shannon Morrison. Yeah. First thing I want to say is to those four guys, if they ever happen to listen to this, thank you for what you did for the herd, right? Specifically, uh, Shannon Morrison, who's a guy that played here, has coached here several times. You know, he's he's a he's Marshall through and through. And of all the four, that was the most surprising to me. You know, but I I don't make these decisions. That's fine. They, but I just wanted to say thanks to those guys because despite the results that played out on the field, they still came to work every day, worked their ass off to make their group the best that they could possibly be. Even though the results didn't play out on the field throughout the season, the way we as herd fans would have wanted them to, Mm -hmm. I can feel fully confident in saying none of these guys showed up to work and coasted, right? right? They were all trying to, get it right, or improve. Mm -hmm. It just didn't work out. Now, that turns the page to, what do you do? People are going to speculate. People are going to say, we should hire this guy. They should hire that guy. Ultimately, we don't freaking know, right? Because Mm -hmm. every coach under the sun is going to be thrown out by every Tom, Dick, and Harry out there with an opinion as, this should be our OC. That should be our OC. Look at this. Look at that. He's connected to Huff this way. This would be a great guy. He puts up tons of points here, there, and wherever. For the first time in a long time, I mean, maybe a decade or more, I really don't have an opinion other than who I don't want to see in Huntington. That that's that's really it, you know. And it might be unfair, but there are there are just potential guys out there that I don't want to see in mm-hmm. Huntington. Um, but for the first time in a long time, I want to. I want the process to play out, and I want to see um, how the um, how the candidates are analyzed, and who ultimately is brought in under what assumption or under what not assumptions, but like what's the system going to look like? Because you know you got a dual threat quarterback here. You know you know what we've seen throughout the season from the wide receiver room, from the running back room, who may not have one of the greatest to ever. 
tote the rock in it anymore next year. Uh, lots of offensive linemen going to be shaken up because the, some of these guys have exhausted eligibility. A couple guys walked in senior day that can return, but will they return? There's a lot to be, um, a lot of questions to be asked in a very or to be answered in a very short time because you got portal season opening up, you've got early signing day opening up, you got bowl prep, you've got a lot of shit that is coming right here in this quick two three week window. You don't want to miss the portal window. You don't want to miss early signing period. So you can't drag your feet on hiring somebody. It's got to be pretty quick, you know, and, and then you're hoping, okay, can that guy bring in some guys with him that he's recruited at his previous stop or whatever to help the herd win immediately. So I don't know where you want to go. I don't know where you want to talk about with this. Uh, these, these, these changes were not surprising. Some of them more so than others. <laughs> But I don't think anybody was was surprised that it, out of the four, three of them come along uh, on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, that uh, that is no surprise. I think that we've seen these issues throughout the year. Uh, we've had struggles on offense. We have mentioned a couple of times that when people we thought were unfair about Cam Fancher, that, hey, it's not just quarterback. You know, as soon as the snap, hits his hands, you've got, you know, he's got to start dancing because you've got two or three guys. I mean, that blows up all your progressions to try to throw to your receivers because first you have to avoid a sack. Mm -hmm. And that you, it's not like everyone says, all right, let's let him do that. Let's quit with these routes and, and defenses. That changes everything. The wide receivers, we said we needed to have more separation and everything and that we really didn't have a breakout wide receiver uh, for the year, uh, some of the the ones uh, in this game, Chuck Montgomery scored in the uh, opening game of the year. He didn't score again until the last game of the year. Yeah. You know, we uh, I think he at one time they said that's his fifteenth reception during that game, and you're thinking, man, can that coming into right? the season? Yeah. Right. You know, and, uh, you know, I don't think anybody had more than 35-ish or something like that. So it was just like, you know, separation, not only on your routes, but in that room to come out and say, I'm the guy, I'm the the reliable guy. So it just seemed like there were some offensive problems all year long. Mm -hmm. And um, it is no surprise to me that there was some kind of a change, especially after the severe struggles of last week going scoreless several games this year. We scored three points going into the, uh, into the half and two games this year, we did not have an offensive touchdown at all. Yeah. Uh, or maybe it was even more, maybe it was three. Um, but we, we definitely went 11 quarters at one time without an offensive, uh, touchdown, but, uh, I am not surprised there's a change. I am, uh, Always, it's the nature of the business with the timing of when the season ends, but I'm always sad to hear about people losing a job right before the holidays. Yeah, you know, but that's there's that's the coaching carousel. There's, there's nothing nothing you can do about that. It's just, you know, it's un, it's unfortunate with the timing and everything, but it's not like you just say, hey, man, Christmas is coming up, so we can't have any staff changes. Yeah. I mean, that's just... that's Well, the, the other side of that coin is all four of these guys will undoubtedly have another opportunity nearly immediately. That's just the yep. nature of the game. Right. You know, mm -hmm. so when one door closes, another one will open. It's Marshall's yeah. not the only school to fire coaches. You know, there have been right. lots and, and some big waves have rolled through. So it's unfortunate, but I think everybody in, in the herd universe is like, OK, mm -hmm. that's why I said earlier. Now the onus falls on who do you hire? What are we going to look like? Who's the offensive coach that we're going to dive into and dissect this off season and this bowl season to figure out, all right, here's what he did before. And here's what we might be able to expect. And, you know, all those conversations get to start back up. It's, it's, it's a, it's fueled some intrigue, right? It's easy for me personally, it's fueled intrigue. Cause now I want to know who the, who the hell the guy is or the guys, mm -hmm. um, which direction will we go? And what will we look like? Are we going to, you know, now that Ali's gone, potentially, are we going to go to a more pass-heavy offense? Is it still going to be line up and run the ball? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued and I'm excited. This is the kind of stuff. Like, some things got put to bed. We're going to a bowl game. Now you get to look forward to recruiting. You got staff changes. You got all this. Stuff. Now it's like intriguing again and re-energizing after a really long and hard-fought regular season. Yeah, and uh, just like we were talking about with the timeline with our bowl, 
either uh, the FCS playoffs or the bowl season that in FBS, you've got to look if you're hiring from there. Yeah. Most of the time, unless it's somebody that is currently a quarterback's coach and taking a step up or something like that, they're not going to leave until after their season is over, you know? So uh, getting a, a wonder from the FCS level, which has worked for other schools before, uh, you might not see that until that season is over. So I don't know that we're going to see anybody named and replaced until our bowl game is finished. And that's like, okay, you're down four coaches who steps up to take over those duties. You know, um, it's just, it's, it's highly interesting. It is. And it is. Uh, I don't know that we can wait that long. You know, because you're talking about 15 practices. That's that's evaluation time for young talent. That's that's the I time know. to get some, get your coaches in there and see what they can do with who you got. I I, I don't know. You know, I, I but think, do you, but do you do you turn down the guy that you want or the top five guys you want because they won't come here before uh, their season is ended? You don't just know to that take somebody that. that would. You know, we don't know that they. I know I don't do know, but no, I'm not saying, you personally, but you yeah. like the general you. You don't know that yeah. they wouldn't take the job. It, it's it's just I don't know. I mean, if you go after somebody and he says, "Yeah, but I can't until we're eliminated from the playoffs." And you're like, well, that could be after signing day. That could be after the, then you're not our guy. Can't do that. You know, we need somebody. That's what I'm do. saying. Do you walk away from somebody that would be the guy that says, hey, I'd love to, but, you know, I've got eight more days that, you know, mm. I just, I, I don't see it. I would rather get the guy uh, because I don't think it's going to impact our early signing day. Uh, I just don't. Uh, you've got to get through a bowl game. And let's face it, I want to win every bowl game. But this hire is more important than the results of this bowl game. If we yeah, for sure. come, you know, uh, so if if it ends up that we're like, hey, we just have to use the existing coaches from, uh, that we have right now and somehow come up with a way uh, to get through these practices and bowl games, I would much rather do that than to hire someone just because they're okay with moving up and, and taking this position or positions. And we right don't now. know if it's a guy who's going to, we might be interested in somebody who's out of a job right now. Right. You don't know a I'm, team that isn't in the playoffs or right, a team that's right, not right. going to a bowl game. Who knows? There's, yeah. there are literally thousands of candidates out there, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So who knows? But it's, it's a, it's, I love this time of year. I hate it. And I love it, you know, because if you're replacing four coaches, obviously something didn't go right. Mm -hmm. Well, the only other time is if it's something went really right and people are hiring your guys away. But yep. I love this sort of thing, man. This is the this is really fun time of year for me. I I love the speculation, but well that um, that ends a long, long five things cares? because we had a lot of discussion that we had to do is either discuss it in five things or discuss it during <laughs> the football segment. Yeah, uh, we got it out of the way because those are five things that we need to know. And as always. Brought to you by Ignite Link. Boy, Ignite Link got their money's worth this week. But man, that that that's all discussion stuff that honestly could have been a second episode all its own this week. Sure. You know, sure. we could have talked about all of that stuff and just gone on about it for an hour. We nearly did, but I don't care. This is this is the part of year that's so fun to talk about. And I don't want to not talk about it just because I got a game to talk about. But hey, I got a game to talk about. Actually, yep. uh, Arkansas State came to Huntington for senior day, first ever matchup between Red Wolves and the Herd, and Herd gets the victory. 35-21, to 21, score was a lot closer than the game actually was, and the Herd is now 6-6, six and 3-5 six, and five in the Sunbelt Conference, sixth place in the Sunbelt East Division, climbing out of the basement via tiebreaker. I know some people laugh about that, but we climbed out of the basement over um, Georgia Southern, who lost to Appalachian State. So thanks to the Mountaineers for putting the uh, Eagles in the basement and us out of the basement. Russ, this was a really fun game to watch on TV, I must say. Uh, to, to see the herd get it clicking early, defense was playing really well. There was a lot to be on the line. I mentioned you know, all the things that were on the line. I think I had six or seven things I talked about in the preview. And by winning this game, they checked the box on all of those six or seven things. You know, they went five and one at home. They sent their seniors out at home the right way. They gained bowl eligibility. They climbed out of the basement, all those things. And that was just kind of the 
cherry on top of a rough season. They, we, we needed this one not just to be bowl eligible. We needed this so that the fan base could go, one more at home. We got one more at home. You know, Owen mm-hmm. Porter, you know, Dalton Tucker, Micah Abraham, Eli Neal, all these 18 seniors that they honored uh, won their final game at Jones C. Edwards Stadium. You know, that was really awesome. That was really awesome. And we're going to talk about indicators. I'm going to talk about all this stuff. But before the game started, we had a tailgate. So I, I didn't know much about the tailgate. We weren't able to do Thundercast live. We That was on the fence, and we were trying to wait up until the very end if we'd be able to or wouldn't be able to. Ultimately, we were not able to. So I didn't get a vibe of the tailgate. Um, another, you know, Landscaping by Hillcrest sponsored event. So how did it go? That went pretty well. Uh Tailgating was sparse everywhere. Uh, you know, if you see the attendance is low, tailgating is going to be low. Uh, but not at our tailgate. We had a, a decent little turnout. Um, we had uh, chili, uh, grilled cheese, peanut butter sandwiches. For the life of me, I don't know why some people like peanut butter sandwiches <laughs> with their chili, but I made them anyway. And uh, we had uh, two different types of cornbread and Plenty of full coolers. Uh, I I mentioned uh, Karen Legrand brought uh, three different kinds of desserts and everything. So we got there early, had a good time. All of that made possible by Landscaping by Hillcrest. Uh, Go to their website, landscapingbyhillcrest.com. See what they can do to transform your space that you have. But uh, can't thank those guys enough. Four of our six tailgates this year are sponsored by them. Yeah, they've been they really came on and and decided, you know what, this is something we want to be a part of and we appreciate them, you know, because mm. a it helps them get their name out there uh with herd fans and we talk about it all the time, who do herd fans want to do business with, Russ? Herd, herd fans. fans. That's right? right. So so they got behind us and and helped us put on these tailgates and you know, while they may want to do this again next year and I fully hope that they do. It's not mm-hmm. too early to say, hey, 2024 football season, we're going to have more games that are that will be looking for tailgate sponsors. And unless they come to us and say, hey, you know what? Just shut that down. We want to do the whole season, which very well may happen. Um, if you've got a small business, medium business, whatever business you want to be, figure out how you can get in there and, and uh, be a part of a herd game day from a fan standpoint and get your name out there, give us a call because uh, it's never too early to start prepping for 2024. But uh, they were so great this year. I hope they decide they want to come back and uh, lock down the whole season. That would be awesome, you know, for yeah. them to just uh, have a, have it dedicated, have a dedicated thing every year or every game. No, it's them. That would be so cool. Uh, I'm glad that it was a good turnout. I'm glad that, uh, you know, some people hit me up on social media saying, hey, are you going to be there? Where are you guys at? Always see lot back corner, right behind the big video board. Can't miss it, right? Russ is usually there wearing some sort of you know Thundercast branded shirt. Uh, really easy to spot, but the game is the the crown jewel of this weekend. And it was it was nice, man. It was really just nice to watch a herd team execute and things mm-hmm. go right, man. It was really really nice to see that. It was. Um, fun to watch on television as a matter of fact my wife sat there next to me she never watches games right that's because it's not her thing but even she was like into the game she got into it and was asking me like well who's this guy and who's that guy and why do they always run right up the middle (laughs) i'm like well that's where the play goes you know it's like well still you know it's just funny stuff like that but uh let's talk about it man 35 to 21 we mentioned The indicators for the first time in a long time, Russ, not swept by the herd, but pretty damn close. And the one indicator that we did not edge was pretty inconsequential. Total yards, 493 yards for this herd offense to just 305 for Arkansas State. Time of possession, what a turnaround. 36 minutes, 56 seconds for the herd, 23 minutes, 4 seconds for Arkansas State. Holy moly, nearly. 14 minutes, nearly a whole quarter. What a 180 from previous weeks. First downs, 23 to 20. Edge heard third downs. Hello, 8 of 18 for the herd. Hasn't been there all year long. And here it was this year or this game. 
nearly 50% on third down, all while continuing to hold opponents to an abysmal rate, just 3 of 14 for the Red Wolves. Penalties is where Arkansas State got the edge, but it really didn't matter. Seven uh, for 89 yards for Arkansas State, eight penalties for 98 yards for the Herd. And let me tell you, I finished my rewatch and 15 yards of those, which the the penalty itself and the yardage was all decided the next to last play of the game is what, what put that up there. So the indicator was almost, we tied with them uh, in a uh, uh, number of penalties and we would have had just a few more or a few less yards than them. So nearly swept there too. Yeah, as I said, totally inconsequential. When both teams have that many yards, it, it, something has, you know, n- usually something isn't too far to one side to where it matters. And then yeah. turnovers is a push. Two to two, but one each occurred on that weird play to where Arkansas State fumbled, we recovered, then Stephen Dix Jr. fumbled it, and then they recovered, and it ultimately ended up in like a 20-yard loss for Arkansas State. That was basically what that one turned out to. So, All intents and purposes, it was one-to-one on turnovers that kind of mattered. Let me talk about these uh, individual stats for our guys, and then we'll get through to revisiting keys to victory and grades. Cam Fancher, Russ, what a day for Cam Fancher. Accounts for five total touchdowns, 16 of 22, 214 yards, three touchdowns through the air, no interceptions, 18 carries on the day, For 100 yards exactly, two more touchdowns on the ground led the team, by the way. He did have a lost fumble late in the game on another exchange uh, and a long of 63 yards on a beauty of a scamper that on that touchdown drive, he accounted for 70 rushing yards on that one. Uh, 5.6 yards per carry on the day for Cam. Ethan Payne led the way from a rushing yards standpoint. 19 carries also led the team, 113 yards, new career high for Ethan, 5.9 yards per carry and a long of 64 for him. Rasheen Ali, 14 carries for 56 yards, 4.0 yards per carry, a long of 27, which put him over the 1,000-yard mark, 1,043 yards on the season, 14 touchdowns on the year. And then uh, let's talk about a trio of wideouts. You mentioned Charles Montgomery. Might have to steal the Chuck McGill nickname. This might have to go to Charles Chillington. We might have to call him Chuck Chill from now on because that was a really great performance that he turned in on just four receptions, which led the team, and just 57 yards, which led the team, but two very dynamic plays for touchdown, uh, 12.8 yards per reception. Then Caleb McMillan, the senior, had a really nice catch. He had two of them, actually, for 39 yards and the touchdown, which was a dime in the back of the end zone from Cam Fancher. Beautiful touchdown pass, 19.5 yards per reception. And then Talit Keaton, two receptions for 34 yards, averaging 17 yards per reception. The herd went up 28-7 to in the first, at the end of the half, first half. They scored two first quarter touchdowns, Russ. This was what we needed out of this herd offense. They had five total pass plays of 20-plus yards. We had a a spattering of chunk plays, three runs of 25-plus yards, and two runs of 60-plus yards. This is exactly what we had hoped to see all year long when this herd offense is clicking. They are clicking. Also, of note, first time the herd has had two 100-yard rushers in a game since, well, senior day of last season. I like that trend. Let's let's keep that one rolling. That was against Georgia State, if you'll remember in that one. Kalen Laburn went for 104. Rasheen Ali went for 103. Um, I'm, do you have anything just to say before, or are you going to save it for grades? No, I just want to point out that we had nine different receivers, uh, either out of the backfield, tight end room, whatever, that uh, made catches. 16 total receptions amongst those nine. So it was like equally spread out. And I just thought that was great. And you already mentioned five different players making 20 plus yard receptions. Yeah. Four, or I'm sorry, nine receivers, pass catchers, and five of those had at least one catch over 20 yards. That's how you spread it around. And that's how you do some damage. Defensively, it's a youth movement that I'm not sure we can call a youth movement anymore because boy these three guys in particular have grown up over the last half of this season and man it looks like they're going to be big weapons for this herd secondary moving forward leading the way Deani Hill 
eight total tackles, five solo, and a pass defended. Amir Foster, seven tackles, four solo, and an interception. That was a near 99 and a half yard pick six. So close, but the knee was down. And then also had a second interception wiped out, if I'm not mistaken. It was. Uh, Eli Neal, seven tackles, two solo, half tackle for loss. And then A.G. McGee to round out the top four for the herd with six tackles and four solo. The herd, from an impact play standpoint, had three sacks on the day. Uh, one by Mike Green, one by Sam Burton. And then uh, final play of the game, I'm pretty sure, was uh, Harshon Sakdiva, number 43. If you didn't know, now you know. And he almost had his damn jersey ripped off, if you've seen the replay on that. Well, it was uh, it was actually ripped the play before that. And so going lining up for that final play right under the arm was the <laughs> only true. place. Like, he had one strand or something <laughs> left, and it was just, you know, a solid white, which he was wearing underneath, you know. And uh, – uh, the other thing you mentioned there, uh, the second interception by Foster, it was taken back, and it was uh, not a late hit. It was uh, a low, low hit. hit. Yeah, yeah, it was right, right at the hip or right below the hip. It wasn't like he tried to take a knee out or anything. No. Is that the waist? Uh, you know, and it was uh, that was the final fifteen yards that gave them the uh, the lead and uh, less. Uh, oh, in penalties, penalties, yeah. So the other bullet points are the herd loud, just 42 yards rushing to a team that the week before racked up 291 rushing yards and seven rushing touchdowns. Uh, they did allow 263 passing yards, but 96 of those yards came on three completions. So it was really um, a, a, a chunk play day from a receiving standpoint, but they bent and really didn't break. But I will tell you this. I got to give props to Corey Rucker and Courtney Jackson. Those guys are good receivers, and they fought yeah. for yardage. They're big-bodied guys, and, man, they had an impact for that Arkansas State Red Wolves offense. And uh, young Rainer, he's going to be a good quarterback, man. There's no day, no no way around that. And not to slight Foreman either. He had a couple of huge, huge receptions there. Uh, one of them was 40-some yards. Yeah. Uh, they 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 got all of theirs on long, long uh, catches. Yeah, they. I mean, they competed for some 50-50 balls, and hell, that one yeah. time it dropped in triple coverage, and that was I was yeah. like, damn, what the hell's happening here? Anyway, yeah. on the special teams, that was the rough part of the day, um, kind of by a mile. Reese Verhoff, oh, of two on field goals, he had one blocked, and he missed one. He did go five of five for extra points. John McConnell had another solid day though: six punts, two hundred fifty-two yards, a forty-two yard average, and a long of forty-six. Couple of of uh, kick returns we got to talk about. Jaden Harrison just had one crack at it. It went for 19 yards. And how about Eric Meeks? He gets one on a squibbish type kick, and he takes it 17 yards. The big guy doing work, 17 yard kick return, dude. They were ignited on the sideline when he came off the field. I am shocked that he didn't take it to the house. <laughs> you know, it was his one awesome. shot, and he he was not wanting to go down. No, and you know, I can't blame him. And it it looked like the old days of you know, give it to Refrigerator Perry. You better have. <laughs> five or six guys hitting that guy because, man, he just plowed right through a bunch of people. <laughs> and then, of course, the other thing that we have to talk about from special teams is the herd does give up a punt return for touchdown, which was right off of the heels of a drive that felt wasted. And I even said mm -hmm. that. It, it, we, we wasted that offensive possession, and then immediately they got a punt return for touchdown. But ultimately, it didn't matter. You know, it didn't matter. Yeah. 35 to 21, like I said, this game was not as close as the score indicated because, you know, the, the touchdown on a punt return kind of pushes that score up there for the Red Wolves. All right, let's re let's let's revisit some keys to victory, man. What was your number one? Number one is score and hopefully in the 30s. Big green check. We did it. <laughs> well, my number one was as basic as it gets. We're going to have to run and stop the run because, like I mentioned, 291 yards and seven rushing touchdowns. That's cause for concern. It doesn't matter if you're good at stopping the run or not. Uh, when you put up those kind of numbers, you gotta. It's got to be a point of emphasis. And man, the herd did it. They racked up 279 rushing yards of their own with two on the ground and allowed just 42 to, to Arkansas State and one touchdown on the ground. What was your number two? It was to win the turnover battle decisively. We didn't win it. We tied with them to a piece. But uh, I just. I envisioned that we were going to have to get, if you remember, three to their uh, one or mm -hmm. five to their three or something that we could not have five turnovers and win this game. And uh, ultimately, it did not matter. Uh, both teams protected the ball fairly well. Mm -hmm. 
and we won anyway, but we didn't win that uh, red X for me on uh, that key. Yeah, it, the the fumble by Cam on the exchange happened so late in the game that it was a foregone conclusion that Marshall was going to win that game. So it was inconsequential, but it still happened. Would have been and, really nice if that just didn't happen, and we could have got out of there without a offensive turnover. You know, the the fumble while we were went from offense, I don't know, whatever it was on defense. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that turnover by Cam led almost immediately. It was two plays that they scored a, uh, a, their final touchdown. So yeah. even though it was inconsequential, you still didn't like to see that, you know, yeah. because we almost had a flawless game. Yeah. Uh, my number two key to victory was I, I said we needed to have, remember we didn't know, we needed to have two quarterbacks available. We didn't know that Cam was going to play. That was – up in the air. They kept it hush-hush. And I said we needed to have Cam, Cam Fancher's mobility at our disposal. And boy, we had two quarterbacks available that had played games for the Herd in 2023, and Cam Fancher's mobility played a huge role in the game, specifically in the first half and the first quarter to really jumpstart that Herd offense. Uh, they, they didn't have an answer for him early on the ground. And you could tell when healthy – he is a far more dangerous runner than when he is limited from a mobility standpoint. He had the zip, and it was awesome to see from him. What was your number three? That the return game makes an impact. And other than Eric Meeks making a huge impact on some Arkansas State shoulder pads when he plowed through everybody, we didn't need it. Uh, yeah. But we also didn't have an impact uh, from our return game. So a red X on that key for me. I'm going to have to say you got to give it a half because of the way the sideline ignited when Meeks got the return, man, because that's an impact. Those goose, those dudes were jacked up. Uh, no, I was talking about uh, not just putting points on the board, but it was about flipping the field and yeah. stuff like that, and we, we just didn't have any of those. But, again, there weren't many opportunities either. Yeah. Uh, this is my first X of the of the day in, in my uh, keys to victory, which is number three. I said, I think J.J. Roberts needs to return. He didn't return. He was on he was in street clothes. And you know what? We went out and saw three young DBs step up. Mike Abraham had a pretty decent game, too. But we saw Foster step up in a huge way. A.G. McGee step up in a good in a big way. And Deani Hill, they all three collectively picked up all of the slack and then some for an absent J.J. Roberts. And when from a game the day or the week before against South Alabama, they were exploited a little bit, you know, and for, for those guys to have a bounce back performance collectively, um, I was glad I was wrong. We did not need J.J. Roberts back there. It just would have been an added luxury if he were there. Uh, number four, what do you got? It was the, the fans make a difference, and I had asked that we show up and show out, and if we were going, that we invited a friend or two friends with us, and that if you were there uh, and you couldn't get other people, you still were loud enough for two people. You were loud enough for three people. I will tell you that the ones that showed up to this game, and I never did see the announced attendance. I'm going to assume it was around 15. I got it. Uh, no, it's 18,673. Yeah. So I think that there was less than that actually in the stadium. Uh, but the uh, the fans that were there, they stayed the whole game, uh, and they were loud. So I 100% do believe that even though it wasn't the crowd that I was hoping for, or maybe even the players were hoping for, I think that they were there, they were involved, and uh, I think that they did make an impact. Yeah. They did. That was actually my bonus thing was I need. I thought we needed a, fit, a, a packed stadium, though it was not packed. Like I said, 18-6 is all we got, and I am just never, ever, ever, regardless of circumstance, ever going to be okay with a crowd smaller than 20K at Marshall. Just not going to be okay with it. And for a lot of the reasons that you should have turned out, it wasn't terribly cold from what I – nobody has said that to me that it was all it was brutal cold and, you know, it was really kind of harsh to set in those conditions. It wasn't, you know, like pouring the rain or anything. So it's kind of a really good scenario for a late November game. It, it doesn't get yeah. too much better. Um, but you could have showed out a little bit better for those seniors. You could have showed out a little bit better for to fuel those guys to bowl eligibility. You, you don't know. We could have been in a dogfight and – you know, and a louder crowd could have played a bigger role. But I will tell you this, of the 18,000 that it was announced, and you say there were fewer inside, which I'm going to default and say you're probably right, 
I had some resounding We Are Marshall chants come through on television, so yep. they did make an impact. They were yelling for two. A lot yep. of those fans were yelling for two. So uh, even though it was not a packed stadium, it was an impactful stadium. Uh, yep. So my my actual number four key to victory was I think the herd just needs to find a way, is what I said. I, I felt confident that they would. But, man, when, first time all year, Russ, that I can remember – that we jumped out early and were able to cruise to a degree in the second half. We didn't mm -hmm. have to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. We didn't have to make things happen. We didn't have to come from behind. We held a lead, a substantial lead. And they scored, you know, off of that punt return, and then we scored. So it wasn't like they were able to keep momentum in the second half. They scored a late one. didn't matter. So the herd was able to answer right after – uh, Arkansas State got the punt return, which allowed them to continue to keep cruising and running the football and chewing the clock and all those sort of things. They found a way, man. They found themselves a little bit. They were, they were, you could tell those guys were having a good time. And I'm really happy for them. How about some grades, man? What yeah. Do you so, for, what do you uh, got for uh, Cam Fancher in this game? I have for Cam an A plus. And the only real ding that you could think of would be that late, late uh, fumble. But it was not enough, even if it wasn't during an exchange, uh, it was not enough for me to take him away from an A+. Mm -hmm. Just top to bottom, tremendous game from him. Um, deserving, in my opinion, of an A+. I can't go A plus, even though you go five touchdowns to just one interception. It's a solid A performance anyway. There were, there was no interception. I mean, I meant uh, fumble. I meant turnover. Fumble. Turnover yeah. is what I meant to say. Yeah. Uh, so you go five touchdowns, one turnover. Fans are going to take that. They should be willing to take that every game. It's just mm -hmm. not an A plus because you have a turnover that actually you indicated that it led directly to a quick touchdown. You know, so if that it happens, did. if that happens early in the game. Huh, maybe you change the trajectory of what it looks like, but you it, know, it would it would have changed my grade if it happened early in the game too. So it, the other thing, part of that is that it happened early in the season, the middle of the season, and now the end of the season, fumbling a, an exchange, and you know that's a basic part of Marshall's offense. And either you're handing it off or you're pulling it. And if you want to wait to the last second, I get it. You're trying to get a read, but if that's what you're going to do, damn it, hold on to the football, you know. But it was a solid A performance. He played great. And I even used the term he balled because he did. He balled out. Yeah. He put that offense on his back for a big part of it. Made great, great reads, crisp throws, catchable balls, allowed his receivers to make plays for him. All the things that we and other folks had been saying were missing from the game all year long showed up in this one. They did. Put it together and had a great all-around performance. Five total touchdowns. 100 yards on the ground, 214. How many times have I said Cam Fancher is at his best when he goes 200, 225 yards on through the air and 100 yards on the ground? That's his best performance. And it showed up A all the way around. What do you got for this offense as a whole? I've got an A minus and uh, would have been an A. We had a bunch. They had nine tackles for loss, including uh, in the, those tackles for loss, three sacks. But there were several times that as soon as A.J. Turner got it or Payne got it or uh, second play of the game, I think, when uh, Ali got it, someone was there. Mm -hmm. There was a couple of times that uh, Cam had to run for his life and try to scramble to make something. And he did. He made something just about every time. Uh, but there were too many times that it looked like either missed blocking assignments or something that someone was back there to blow up a play almost immediately untouched. So they didn't get a full a plus from me, but a hell of a job, especially coming off of zero points and the struggles that we had had, except for the 75 week, the last, I don't know, six games or five games, whatever it ended up being, um, 35 points, five touchdowns, four of those in the first half early in the first half. Mm -hmm. that they had four touchdowns, four touchdown drives in a row. So I think that they deserve at least an A minus. Uh, it would have been higher if uh, if the blocking uh, would have been a little bit better. But a caveat of that, 
they opened up some amazing holes and they protected Cam for most of the game. So it's almost one of those Jekyll and Hyde things. The few times that it came through, it was because someone was untouched. It just made it seem that much worse than what it was. The O-line did a hell of a job that game, and I do not want to take away from them whatsoever. We had over 300 rushing yards when you don't take away the uh, uh, sack yards for Cam. Right. There is no way that they had a bad game whatsoever. I'm just saying that's why it went from an A-plus down to an A-minus. Yeah, and which was made known to me after the fact was that Trent Holler wasn't available for this game. I didn't yeah. I didn't uh, even it, notice that. Yeah, he uh he got hurt and had to leave the the game before uh uh in the South Alabama game and everything yeah. and he just did not get back uh to the level that he needed to be to safely play and to to make an impact. So Jalen Slappy played uh I think just about the majority if not every offensive uh play uh he was out there and got a got a lot of uh um experience even though he's been playing increasingly more over the last three or four games and uh, i think it's Tariq montgomery uh he he played quite a bit as well yeah but and i will tell you this of those uh tackles for loss arkansas state absolutely earned some of them because they brought extra defenders. They sold out on a run a couple of times and, you know, were able to, there's nothing your offensive line is going to do. They brought too many guys to be able to block, you know, and they guessed right on the play call. There's just not much you're going to be able to do because they, they had a party at the running back a couple of times, you know, on a third and short or whatever. And um, so some of them, you know, they just absolutely earned. So a little if, bit of credit to them too. Um, but yeah, uh, overall, great day. A is right. fair. 35 points is <laughs> you're going to win a lot of football games if you score 35 offensive points, right? Um, credit, credit to Arkansas State for that. But it, on the rewatches, when you know it, it was it was more apparent to me there were some easily missed blocking assignments, and it wasn't just always on the blitz. And some people were untouched. And you're talking about a recipe for a turnover. Oh, sure. Because somebody gets hit, you know, blindsided uh, and they're not expecting it. So um, that's why, you know, they did a hell of a job. I'm not trying to take away from it, but there were some missed assignments and uh, that that brought them down to an A minus from an A plus. For sure. The other things you got to talk about with his offensive performances, Ethan Payne goes over a hundred yards, a lot of hard yards for him too. He was uh, not shying away from contact, which is his MO. You know, he, he's a power type back and it was nice to see him falling forward. It was nice to see him dishing out some punishment. And I'm glad he set a new career high in this game. That was really awesome for him. Uh, Chuck Montgomery had a, out of nowhere performance because we had been hoping to see that all year long and it just wasn't there. And, and he had, mm -hmm. he had, he had disappeared from the stat sheet in several games, you know, through the stretch in the middle and the end of the season and to have him come back and have his talents actually be on display, you know, the end of the, getting the edge and, and, you know, diving for that touchdown and get, getting in there. And he just, He's such a dynamic player, and he can be, and I hope he is, a massively huge part of this offense in a bowl game and then forward in 2024. He's just such a special uh, wide receiver, man. And and he, I don't know if you were able to watch his post-game uh, press conference comments. I recommend mm -hmm. that anybody's listening to this. If you haven't done it, you need to go listen to him because um, – you can tell he wants to be at Marshall. He's very appreciative of the community. He is very per, per, uh, appreciative of his teammates and how they are uh, constantly a source of um, an uplifting force for him and wholesome kid, man. I'll tell you that he's easy to pull for. He's easy to root for. And uh, my fandom for him uh, grew quite a bit based on those post game comments, not because he found the end zone twice. It's it's what he had to say after the game. It was really really nice for uh, for me to hear some of those things. What do you got for this defense? I have an A for them, and uh, man, it was really close to an A plus. Uh, giving up uh, some of the jump balls that they did, that was just excellent wide receiver play. You mm -hmm. know, um, there were uh, not too many chunk plays whatsoever, other than those jump balls. Um, 
I, I ding them just a little bit for some of the penalties. And that was, you know, erasing a uh, game icing interception at the end. Mm -hmm. That was uh, extending some drives because of uh, late hits and things like that. Um, it, a, I think it's fair. They did an amazing job. You mentioned already 42 rushing yards. Well, they had 43 at halftime. So in the second half, <laughs> negative one rushing yards. <laughs> That's what our defense did. Yeah. A little bit more about what they did um, in the second half. Uh, they gave up 74 rushing or passing yards in the second half. Um, I mean, just crazy numbers that they had 73 yards in the second half. 73. Yeah. Other than that punt return, and, you know, they got that score uh, late in the game where it's desperate to just, hey, let's chuck chuck some up here. Um, they didn't do they, squat. They, sh they <laughs> shut them out, man. They, yeah. I mean, it was, it, was, it was great. So, I mean, really, really super close to an A-plus effort. Uh, from me, I uh, give him an A, like I said, just because some of the penalties. Yeah, it was a smothering performance that um, they just, we needed. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We just needed to see that. That's it. We just needed that type of performance. And you look in the, uh, you're looking at, well, second half, you got punt, 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 fumble turnover on downs, and then a late touchdown. They were not able to do anything yeah. at all. And it was so great to see so many guys step up, uh, so many guys make plays. and uh, Youngsters, guys, seniors, like all that stuff, man. There were a lot of guys in on a lot of plays. If you look down, I mean, I, I can't count them all. It's a lot It's a lot of guys, and some of them just made like one, you know, one tackle. Mm -hmm. But, I mean – Hill, Foster, Neil, McGee, Dix Jr., Green, Porter, Abraham, Henderson, Burton, Gibby, you know, Sack Diva. And then it's all the guys with just one tackle. And I'll tell you what, for a guy that had no tackles in the game, no tackles, and, and recredited with only one pass defended, from the get-go, they were seemingly trying to test Josh Moten. And he mm. was up to the task immediately, I guess to the point where they were like, all right, let's try somebody else. Because he had zero tackles credited in the game and only one pass defended. And I, if I'm not mistaken, it was like the first two plays of the game went to his guy. Yeah, on the rewatch, it didn't seem that he was out there near as much uh, toward the end. So, you know, I don't know how many snaps he was in on, but uh, uh, these other guys were out there <laughs> more than him. Yeah, um, I did want to say that uh, uh, Micah Abraham had three passes defended. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, man, Burton, when he got through, um, he got one sack credited to him, but he allowed a couple other guys to get back there because, I mean, he was just right there and somebody had to peel off onto him, but, uh, man, Mike Green, he got a couple of huge plays and one of them was, uh, on that fourth down or to force a fourth down. I can't remember which, which of the two it was, but, uh. I mean, it was like, hey, let's hold the guy. Let's hold him. They called the holding. We had to, you know, decline it because he still got through and sacked the, the guy. Tackles for loss, hitting him in the backfield. Great, great game by Mike Green. Yep, and uh, that's another one that had some post-game comments. Uh, Huff even talked about him during his segment of post-game, uh, that it was that it really just started clicking for Mike later in the season. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that's – what we can expect more of next year, man, what a great replacement for, you know, a, a departing Sam Burton or a departing Owen Porter. Mike Green's going to be a big part of this defense. Even saw some play out of the youngster, man, the guy from the spring game that everybody got flashes of. Elijah Russell got some game in this, in mm -hmm. this one. And, you know, you started to see a little bit late in the game when Marshall kind of had the game sealed away. We started seeing some of those defenders that, you know, were probably going to be a bigger contributor next year. It was nice. It was nice to be able to, have that sort of game that we could do that. What do you got for this special teams unit? I got a C minus, and you already mentioned, you know, we allowed a uh, a punt return for a touchdown, and we uh, missed two field goals, uh, both in the 30 to 39 range, and one of those was blocked. 
I do have to give them points though for um keeping cross in check. I mean, he was dangerous and mm-hmm. he only got that one. Uh with seeing his moves and his speed and and just vision. Um we punted to him a few times and we kept him in check. Mm-hmm. And also huge at the end of the game, no matter to where it didn't look like it was that tough to to field. We did what we needed to do with our hands team and had a clean uh, onside kick recovery to help ice that game. Yeah. Uh, so big points on that as well. Uh, there just wasn't an option for us to have too many returns. You know, they didn't kick off to us that often. And uh, we, we did what we could do. And C minus, and most of that's because of the missed field goals. That's fair. Uh, how about the coaching staff? What do you got for the guys? A minus. I feel like we had a game plan. We had everybody prepared. We went out. We executed that. And um, I do not think that it was uh, I, it was boring. But I don't think it was a a bad call to go out and put together a twelve play, eight and a half plus minute drive to take off a lot of the clock. Uh, I would have liked to have seen a bunch of uh, points scored in the second half like we did in the first. But what happens if you go out there and a ball gets tipped off of a receiver's hand and goes for a pick six and you're trying to to score, you're trying to uh, run your offense like you did in the first half and it just doesn't work. I'm fine with what we did. So I give it an A minus. Yeah, I'm with that. I mean, eight minutes, 38 seconds, 12 plays, you only go 32 yards. But, dude, that's in the fourth quarter that that happens, you know? Yeah, it was so from 14.55, like as soon as five seconds into the fourth quarter. So you took off way more than half of the fourth quarter and gave them almost no chance. Exactly. To come back by doing that's that. exactly what you want to happen, to squirrel yeah. away the game. And 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 you, you weren't getting out of there with a win, but you basically put them in a – seemingly uh, impossible yeah. situation that's what yeah. you needed to do and we did that i i am i am really um really happy for you know huff and and this uh staff that though we saw changes occur at the end of the game and and um you know the announcement of the changes occur at the end of the game um they put it together for one final game for the herd you know they did it for the fans one final time they did it for their players they did it for each other it's a good game plan really was yeah, I can only imagine what the preparation was like knowing that you are shut out coming off of a shutout loss and facing a team that just put up a sunbelt record for points. Yeah. You know, and I said, Hey, how awesome would it be if we come in and shut them out? And damn, for a long for nearly the first half, we did. And uh we absolutely almost did in the second half. So really a big chunk of the start of the game, you know, the first, I don't know when it was, I'm gonna say 13 minutes of the game, nothing. And then you had a little bit of a flurry with a quick touchdown before halftime and then a punt return and then nothing. And then something right at the very end that was a short touchdown. This defense was awesome. So what a great effort all the way around. The only thing you can get mad at is special teams and blocked field goal and a missed field goal. That's it. What do you got for the fans? I got a B. I would have liked to have seen more people there, and that's the only ding. Uh, They were loud when they were there, and social media was not uh, ridiculous as sometimes it can get to. Yeah. Uh, It was all right, man. The crowd was small but loud. I'll Mm -hmm. yield to that. Social media was overly, uh, not overly, but, uh, you know, pretty positive. I was only called trash one time. That's far below (laughs) the weekly average. So, hey. was that by your wife or somebody on social media? <laughs> no, that was social media, but whatever, you know. Uh, that's, that's like I said, that's well below the average. It's usually over under four and a half, and it was only one. So yeah. I'm good with that. Uh, it was a good, you're right, solid B. What do you got overall? Overall, A+. plus. We went bowling. We uh, put up 35 points uh, in a great offensive outburst in the first half. Our defense dominated uh, for most of the game. There's just not much that you can say bad about this game whatsoever for overall. Everything yeah. about it, just top to bottom, great. I'm not going to make an excuse, right? It's not. I'm just. I just want to plant a, a, a line of dialogue here. Okay. If this is what this Marshall team looks like most of the season, and they don't have to worry about a ten wins or a ten straight game schedule 
you know, mm -hmm. with an early bye week, if your bye week falls in like week six or something like that, and you really mm -hmm. truly almost get to break it in half. Yeah. And all the guys that stay that looked like they look today, even if they're 85% of that, this is probably an eight or nine win team, you know? Oh, easily. easily. So yeah. this is, this is what we had hoped we would see the majority of the season. And really the last time we saw any semblance of this offensively was NC state way back, you know, mm -hmm. and then it was up and down and up and down. And, um, you know, defensively, it was – this was the rightest I feel like it, is, it had been. They played a pretty good game against James Madison. That was a really good defensive game too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I feel like this was about as right as it, as, as it could have been. You know, more complimentary in this game, I believe, than probably any game all season playing complimentary football. I and would that's say 70, so. And that's 75 we concluded. You mm -hmm. know, and they played a great game offensively in that one also. With a mm -hmm. different quarterback, I might add. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a different way they had to win. It was 160 some yards from Rashid Ali, three touchdowns, that kind of thing. We didn't get that in this game. Instead, you got Cam for 100, Ethan Payne for 119 or 118, and a spreading around of the pass game to where five guys had at least one catch of 20 plus yards or really close to 18 to 25 yards or something. Yeah. So if this is what we would have gotten all year, Marshall's not a six and sixteen. They're a nine win team pushing a ten win team, vying for a spot in the Sun Belt Championship. So I just wanted to say that again, not making excuses, but now we know what this hell, what a healthy herd team, healthier herd team would have looked like. Um, what do you got for your offensive MVP? Pancher. I mean, it's a no brainer. He got all five of our touchdowns. Yeah, fair. Defensive MVP. Who you got? The entire team, which I would like to remind you that I had picked them as the pregame <laughs> MVP, uh, but you just can't single anyone out. They were so complimentary. Uh, like I said, you know, Sam Burton didn't get any kind of credit for a stat uh, when he was almost ready to sack a guy, and then Mike Green uh, stepped up and got that tackle for loss as the quarterback decided to tuck it and run. It's those things that don't show up on the stats that you have to say, this entire team, it was a team performance. Yeah, I'd like to say that I said that the offensive MVP needed to be the entire offense, and that I think they were. Even though Cam accounted for all five touchdowns, guys stepped up and made the big catches when they needed to. Chuck Montgomery had a couple of big runs after the catches. Ethan Payne with the hard yards and the long run. It was a great all-around effort, and the offensive line played so much better. Uh, special much teams better. MVP, who you got? McConnell, uh, there wasn't much any other way to go other than him, and he did his usual average 40-some-plus yards on the punt. So Yeah, he did his job, but I'm going to give him the LeBron treatment because he just does what you expect him to do. Special teams MVP this week is Eric Meeks because the big man got a 17-yard return, and that's just freaking awesome. I'm so happy. That was a great moment. So cool to see that happen. Russ, uh, last things of note we've got to talk about before we go around the herd real fast. Senior day, some of the guys that notably walked that have a decision to make, uh, Trent Holler, Logan Osborne, Gibby, and Rasheen Ali. We've talked about Ali uh, and whether he may or may not return, but those other three guys in particular, Holler, Osborne, and Gibson, all hopefully they return because they will be big pieces and I love Trent, I love Gibby, but if I have to make a choice, if I can only have one, give me the local guy that has been doing work for a number of years. Give me the Cabell Midlander, give me the Knight, give me Logan Osborne. But ideally, I'd love to have all three of them back. If I said this, uh, that celebration to where Logan was kind of pulling Ethan Payne for a couple more yards and then gave the emphatic first down celebration – chef's kiss on, on the, on a really good season for Logan. That was awesome. But that's the things you got to talk about. These guys have decisions to make. The only problem with that is I don't think it was a first down. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Still awesome. <laughs> uh, All right, let's take it around the herd. Let's go around the herd. Yeah. Women's basketball. I was at this game. They eviscerated point park one twenty one to 55 in the home debut last Monday. Uh, of note, this is an NAIA team. It was expected to be like this, but it showed you exactly what this team is capable of. Abby Beeman had a triple-double. Mm -hmm. um, there were uh, steal after steal after steal after steal, which you expect might not translate against every 
uh, opponent that we're going to face this year, but the shooting definitely was. The passing definitely was. So uh, this team is capable of that, and that's why it was so good to watch that game. Uh, what we have, and then we'll get back to your thoughts on it. They travel to Wright State tonight at 7 p.m. On Thursday at 6 p.m., they'll be at Moorhead State. That's a close game for anybody that wants to go there. And then uh, they are hosting the Florida Gators on Saturday at 1 p.m. Yep. Tickets, of course, we have those. We'll be giving those away here in a couple of days. The only thing I want to say about this massive blowout win is, again, 46 three-point attempts. Again, they weren't falling that great, just 13 of 46. We're going to have to nudge that number up a little bit. But overall, 50 out of 104 from the field. You're going to win yeah. a lot of ball games shooting 48%. And especially yeah. if a lot of those threes start hitting. Uh, Rashala Scott, again, leads the way for the herd. 29 points. She's absolutely killing it. She's got to be floating around that 28, 29-point average on the season right now. 20, 26.3. Got right it. There. I knew it had to be somewhere like that. Aislinn Hayes had 20 in this one. You mentioned Beeman with the triple-double. 13, 10 boards, and 11 assists. And Mahogany Matthews had 13 points. Uh Scores are, are popping up now. It's not just Beeman and Scott. It is, and it's also not always going to be the third score is Campbell. So she only had six in this one out of 121 points. So you have other players starting to step up, hit that double-digit mark. This is a fun herd team. Really glad Coach Caldwell got her first win at home at the CAM. Uh, now we just got to keep it rolling. Good luck to them tonight against Wright State. They're a pretty good team, 3-2 and two on the season. Herd's 2-2 two and two right now. But we'll have tickets to that Gators game. Look for them. It's going to be a fun one. Men's basketball, they beat uh, FIU 80-69 to in the second game of the Cayman Island Classic on Monday. And then the next day, the final game of that uh, event, uh, they lost to Oakland 78-71. to Then they got creamed on Friday by number 16 ranked Kentucky, 118-82. to However, 82 points against the number 16 team. They scored 41 in the first half, 41 in the second. So it wasn't, hey, we got a lot of garbage time points. They put up a lot of points. What really got them in that game was just the smothering defense of Kentucky. Um, they look like an amazingly good defensive team. And Kentucky shot ridiculous from the field, uh, notably in the first half, they were eight of 11 from three point land. So there's just not much you can do when someone's hitting like that. And they are the number 16 ranked team. Yeah, of course that's disappointing. I will say this, that Marshall, I think finished sixth, fifth or sixth. They were either going to be one or two in the Cayman Islands classic. And uh -huh. while you're like, well, man, that's really disappointing. Well, it also is disappointing that Obana didn't make the trip because that's an yeah. impactful player that did not play any of those games for the herd. Look what he did against Kentucky. Yeah. So I want to I want to talk about this Kentucky game because that's a big one. Every, everybody, of course, was like, all right, we get to see how kind of how good we are against a really good team. And you talk about shooting the lights out. Holy shit. Kentucky yeah. had 60 percent from the field and nearly 60 percent, 59.3 percent from three point range, 16 yeah. out of 27. When the shots are falling, they're falling. You yeah. know, it, that's nothing tough. you can do. That's tough. Conversely, Marshall just 34% from three point range, nine of 26 and 42%. So the herd shot pretty well, okay, but you're just not going to outpace 60% from the yeah. floor. In that one, uh, Nate Martin, another double double, 14 and 10. Uh, who led the way? Let's see. Obana oh, no. led the way with 22. And Jacob Connor had 13. Kevin Boyles had 10. A couple of guys, Nutter and Kerfman had nine. So a lot of scoring from a lot of guys. And I, th I think it's safe to say that at this point in the season, the herd is just two and four, but Nate Martin is a double-double. Chalk it up. Every game, he's going to be a double-double, it feels like. And it feels like also that just about any game, Oban is going to be a double-double type guy. So it's bounce-back time for the herd. You know, the marquee game now that everybody wanted to see how were they going to be able to do um, is off the table. It's done. It's over, right? So next one on the slate, also Saturday. Yep, 7 p.m., Miami of Ohio. Always good to beat those guys. And that is a great opportunity to have a 1 o'clock game over there, then go grab some dinner, go to a sports bar, do whatever, and uh, probably go and watch uh, some uh, 
football, you know, in between uh, on the tube and then come back for the 7 p.m. game. Nice doubleheader day. Yeah, anytime you get to play Cry Emmy, it's always fun. That should be a, a nice atmosphere because Marshall just doesn't like Miami of Ohio. They're a two and three team also, so they're not super great. The herd's favored big time right now with an 83.4% chance to win at the CAM. And just quick averages the herd's are averaging 74 points on the season, Miami 68. So it's not like a huge disparity here. A bucket here or there could sway that one. Excuse me. Do not let the, uh, do not let the, uh, um, percentage, you know, the PI, FPI sway you in any way. Uh, but Miami is fresh off of a loss to St. Bonaventure, a loss of by 30, 90 to 60. Uh, and they've also lost this year to a uh, fellow Sunbelt uh, team, Texas State, early in the season. They lost that one 60, 75 to 65. So just a couple of markers there of how Miami may or may not do against the herd. But if the shots are falling, the herd's winning, you know that's how it goes. What else we got? Well, we had a disappointing end to an amazing men's soccer season. And they lost yesterday 3 to nothing to Stanford to uh, get eliminated from the tournament. Tremendous, tremendous team and uh, what they accomplished this year, being number one ranked overall and everything. Very disappointing for the final game. We had plenty of chances to to score uh, early, uh, and they just weren't there. Stanford's defense looked great in this game. I will say they were dirty and hands on, but um, the rest were calling it. Yeah, and we just could not get any of our passes through. They they were heading them off before they got to the goal. We had plenty of chances on corner kicks early. We didn't, uh, we didn't get one in, and uh, they tacked on. Uh, they scored a goal early and then tacked on a couple to put it out of reach. Yeah, it was it was a, a disappointing loss, but a great season. And Amazing I'm not going to shortchange anything. You know, this is the second consecutive year the Herd's fallen in the round of 16. But, dude, I don't – are you kidding me? This is a round – this is the sweet 16. You know, if this were basketball, we'd be over the moon, yeah. right? Uh, to, and, to be ranked number one overall and lose in the 16th, yes, it's disappointing. But think about a few years ago to make it to 16, how right. happy we would have been. That's right. how far this program has risen. Yeah, I love that there are expectations here. I love that there are fans that are disappointed by a sweet 16 ousting. Yeah. Uh, it says a lot about this program and how far we've come in a really short time. I still – don't understand soccer. I still don't know what I'm seeing most of the time, but I know it's exciting. And I'll, I'll turn the match on. I had it on. I was watching. And I, again, I, I don't know the strategy. I'm sorry. I don't, you know, it just, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't know what I'm looking at, but I can tell when something looks like it's supposed to, if that makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. it was just, it, it was a really great season. I'm really glad that, uh, you know, we got in early ish, and we're able to secure great seats to continually send fans to those games and and be loud for the herd and, and be an impact and just a great season. I'm really, really uh, happy for Chris Grassy and that coaching staff and those players, even though they are probably ultimately disappointed. They wanted a second star. No doubt about it. They had the team to get it. It just didn't go their way. Um, but we'll regroup the rebuild, the reload. It ain't a rebuild. It's a reload. We'll reload again, and we'll be back stronger, strong as ever and vying for that second star in 2024. They are the standard for Herd Athletics, bar none. Well, that wraps it up for Around the Herd. All right, man. I've got a uh, couple of things I want to say uh, about you know, for my final words, and then we'll get out of here if you don't have any. Uh, what, what I want to say quickly is I'm really, pr really proud of this Herd football team. They could mm -hmm. have packed it in, uh, mm -hmm. and they didn't. They went out and fought one more time to put on the best showing, one of the best showings, probably top two showings uh, of the season. Most complimentary played game all year long. So many guys made plays. Cam Fancher proved that he is a legitimate weapon when healthy. I'm really happy for them. I am also not surprised that we saw – 
a number of changes to the coaching staff announced following the season because there was a large portion of the season where we didn't score points or didn't score enough points, and the name of the game is winning. That's the harsh reality of college sports, particularly mm. college football. And when you don't do enough of it, people aren't going to sit around. You know, that consumers these days will speak with their money. They won't buy tickets. They won't make donations. That's just the way it goes. So now we get to turn our focus on who comes in, what are we going to look like? And what do the recruiting classes look like? What does the portal sessions look like? It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm just really proud of them. I'm glad that these seniors get to go to a bowl game. I'm glad that these underclassmen get to go to a bowl game. Seven straight years of a bowl game, Russ, never happened in herd history. Never. Not in the 90s. Not in the early 2000s. Never happened before. Yeah, we play more bowl games. So what? Seven straight years we've made it to a bowl game. Uh, pretty amazing stuff. And uh, I am anxiously awaiting for hopefully we get a Tampa destination, a Orlando destination, <laughs> somewhere to that I can go to the game and be there to support those guys in person. Do you have any final words? I don't. You summed it up uh, beautifully. And uh, the number one thing you said there is they could have packed it in, and they didn't. That's it. Take us out. All right. So whether you see us at the Joan, whether you see us at the Cam, or whether you see us anxiously waiting to see where we're going to be going bowling, whether you see us, we're going to be saying, go herd. Go herd. It's the Thundercast. We'll see you, I don't know, when, it, when we see you. Later. <laughs>